From our 22 News Broadcast Center, this is 22 News in Focus. Sunday afternoon. Welcome to 22 News in Focus. I'm Kate Walsh. Winter technically hasn't begun yet, but it sure feels like it outside, especially with this past week's frigid temperatures. So that's why on 22 News in Focus this week, we'll be discussing ways to save on your winter heating bills with energy saving programs and low cost do it yourself ideas. It's important because during the winter, our energy costs increase with more electricity and fuel to heat our homes. Some of our neighbors have trouble making ends meet and winter can be a dangerous time of year for them. So joining me now to discuss the fuel assistance and weatherization programs available for low income residents in our region are Peter Wingate, Energy Director at Community Action of Franklin, Hampshire and North Quabbin Region, Waleska Estrada, Fuel Assistance Program Manager for the New England Farm Workers Council and Jamie Chazen, Director of Programs at the Valley Opportunity Council. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. So first I want to go down the line and talk about what your program is and, and who you help. Our community Action serves all of the residents of Hampshire and Franklin County, such as um, the other organizations which serve Hamden County. So mm -hmm. we provide fuel assistance and energy efficiency. Okay. Mm -hmm. New England Farm Workers offers fuel assistance and um, weatherization um, assistance to Springfield residents. And Valley Opportunity Council has a range of services from fuel assistance, uh, daycare, WIC, college access, and adult education, uh, as well as some housing and shelter options. And you help Hamden County? We do, except for our fuel assistance program. That one is everything in Hamden County except Springfield. Okay, so that's where you come in and help with that. That's Makes correct. sense. Mm -hmm. So everyone's covered, basically. <laughs> yes, everyone's covered. And how are your programs funded? Is it all state money, federal money, pr money uh, private funding? How is it all funded? The Fuel Assistance Program is a federally funded program. It's been around for about 35, 40 years. The money comes from Health and Human Services, then is funneled through Department of Housing and Community Development. Then each one of the 22 agencies inside of Massachusetts receives funding from um, DHCD. So since you all represent different regions, would you say that that money is allocated equally? Or do you find that some areas might be lacking in that funding? I think it is proportional to the, the population of the area. And how about Western Mass versus Eastern Mass? We always hear, you know, there's a huge divide. They forget about us here in Western Massachusetts, but do you find that it's pretty fair? <laughs> it is, I mean, um, the, the funding allocation is based on demand um, and when we approve residents for benefits um, it's based on gross annual income so wherever there's a lower gross annual income that's where there would be higher funding okay and you seemed a little hesitant <laughs> but do you, do you think that Western Mass or at least Hamden County receives I enough? think for our fuel assistance program it does okay so how does it work if someone were to call and say that they really needed help heating their home you don't want to turn anyone away but you probably have you know a set amount of money and then it's gone so how does that work well every household is eligible for a certain amount the maximum benefit for a household is eight hundred and fifty dollars this year before a t potential high energy benefit in the history of the program across the state we've never run out of money an individual household can run out of benefit level. They can use up every, everything that's available, but there's never really been a case where a family that has been eligible has not received assistance. So we, it's one of the reasons we really like to encourage everybody who even thinks remotely that they might qualify, that they should call up and find out. Wow. And even those who don't necessarily qualify for fuel assistance benefits, there are additional services that are out there through Chicopee Caring, Westfield Warm, uh, we also have basic needs programs through United Way, which help assist people who are over income for fuel assistance, but still need help with their bills. So you haven't turned anyone away, but towards the end of the winter, do you find that you have to give them less money than you might if they requested it in say November, or is that not really how it works? That's not really how it works. It's set up that they get a, a benefit level and they draw down from that. So let's say if you had oil heat, um, you'd get an oil delivery and the oil company would send us the ticket and that would be counted against your benefit level up until the point that there's no money left on your benefit level. Okay, and then, so they wouldn't be paying the oil company, you would be? Correct. And what kind of other heating um, utility companies do you help well, people with? We, we help with all heating utilities, deliverables such as um, oil, propane, 
um, gas, yes. pr right, kerosene, um, wood pellets, yeah. Do you, what do you find is the most common heat source that people need help paying for? Oil, definitely, yeah. Yeah, and as oil prices peak, then they get less of a benefit. Um, not necessarily benefit amount, but their benefits don't go as far mm. as when the lower oil prices are lower. So when do you find that most people request assistance? Is it they know they're not going to be able to afford it in the winter ahead and they ask for help in November, end of October? Or is it dead of winter, they've run out of money and they don't know what to do? Well, I think I can say for the three of us, we like yeah. people to ask before they run mm -hmm. out of money. The earlier they ask, the better. It's, it's just get somebody in the process because it's it's not an overnight process quite often to get somebody certified. There's a little bit of work that has to be, take place for that. Um, we're now well into December, but we don't want to scare anybody off. If, if they have waited and have not applied yet, don't worry about it. Call us up, call whichever agency you're close to, and get the application process started just as soon as possible. And can you talk us through the process exactly? So they call, they need it, then they have to qualify. What's the qualification process like? So there, there are actually two different processes. Um, if there's an emergency, we handle that a little bit differently. So if somebody is actually completely out of oil, uh, we would be able to, to work with them and try and expedite the process. But again, that only happens when they're actually out of oil. Otherwise, we have people call in and they set up an appointment. If they're a first time applicant, we actually have them come in and we do the intake with them so that we can make sure they have all of the information and that they know exactly what other things they need to bring with them because there is a fair amount of documentation that goes with it. Mm. And can you talk a little bit about what that threshold is for them to be able to, um, to get assistance, the, the monetary you know, threshold there? Sure, I'm sure it's different for everyone, but. It is, it depends on the number of the people in the household. It um, depends on a lot of different things, but in general, a family of four would be about $65,000. And then how much money would they receive from you guys? Depends that on the utility, vary. and yeah. it depends on how they heat. Um, I would say it's from $375 to $850. For VOC, the average is about $600. And that's for the winter? Correct. Yeah. And then do you find that they are running out of that too, or do you make sure that that's enough for them to cover their bills? It really depends on the winter. Last year we had a, a quite a mild winter and pretty reasonable oil bill, so it wasn't quite as harsh. Uh, certainly, we remember a couple years ago when oil was $4 mm. a gallon and the temperatures were even worse, that there was very brutal winters. I think another thing that's important to realize is not only do they qualify for the direct assistance with the heating fuel, but they also become eligible for discount rates on their electric and their gas bills, which can sometimes be 25 to 30 percent off the regular, uh, off the regular rate. So what if people do have this emergency situation where they can't heat their house? Do you, and let's say it's with electric. Would, are there some kind of laws in Massachusetts that stop the utilities companies from just shutting off their service in that kind of situation? For, for households that are certified as eligible or on the discounted rate, they, um, once we get to a moratorium time of, of November 15th, the utility won't shut them off until after the moratorium ends, usually the middle of April to sometime in May. It's, it's usually um, set a little differently each year. So once they are on the low income discount rate, they have protections in place so that they do not get shut off. We of course encourage people to keep making payments and look into payment plans with the utilities, but there are some protections in Massachusetts that are very consumer friendly. What if they're not on that low income uh, qualification? Then, then they are at risk of getting shut off, so that's another reason to give one of us a call and try to get on that discount rate. Mm. And do you find that when the rates for oil and other utilities are higher that specific year, you also receive more federal funding? Is that how it works? <laughs> you hope it works that way? We <laughs> wished it worked that yeah. way. It, it's a little more complicated than that, uh, especially this year. The funding is a little different because we're working on a continuing resolution based on last year's funding so that there really isn't an allocation for this year. And there's a federal formula that actually hurt Massachusetts a little bit because we had a milder winter last year. Uh, the allocation for Massachusetts is lower than last year. So it's lower based on last year even though this winter could be freezing cold every day. Exactly. Right. Does right. that make sense to you? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> yeah.
But unfortunately, I mean, we are dependent on the funding. So, yeah, just like you said, the formula doesn't doesn't benefit Massachusetts at all. Hmm. And over the, over the last 30 years, about half the time the state has come up with some money to augment the federal program. We've not really spoken with the state about it this year, whether that's an option, but other years we've gotten anywhere between five to I think as much as 20 or 30 million from the state. And that's certainly been a, a very important thing to get, especially the years where we had the higher oil prices mm -hmm. and, and the brutal winters. And when it's from the state, is it from the State Department of Health and Human Services, is that what you're saying? It, it, it's always funneled through Department of Housing and Community oh, Development. Housing. Okay. How would you compare Massachusetts to other states in our country? Obviously, Florida might not need the heating that, that we need up in Massachusetts. Is that how it works? Does, do the colder states get more money for heating programs? There are lots of different formulas out there, and I believe some of the southern states get some of that money that they can use towards cooling. Okay. And uh, the, again, the formulas tend to help the states that have the heating issues as opposed to the cooling issues, but mm -hmm. all states do get some sort of light heat assistance. All right, very interesting. We'll talk more about LIHEAP after this break. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Welcome back to 22 News in Focus. Today we're talking about keeping your home warm this winter season. It's a difficult challenge for many trying to make ends meet. So we just talked about fuel assistance and the programs that are available throughout Western Massachusetts. I guess we should mention it by name. It's called LIHEAP, the program. Can you break down what LIHEAP stands for? That's the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. And it's funded by the federal government. It is, yes. Are there other programs locally that might be privately funded or state funded that are available other than LIHEAP? Yes, yeah, so there are some programs that are available through Chicopee Caring Fund, Westfield Warm. There are some area faith-based organizations that have assistance um, as well as the Salvation Army. Oh, okay. So if people, is that if people don't qualify for LIHEAP or can they get it in addition to LIHEAP? I believe it depends, but It'll I think... It'll vary depending on whatever their guidelines are. Some of them would be for people who don't qualify, who are not considered low income. Mm -hmm. and, or um, I know that Council of Churches in Springfield will offer assistance if people have exhausted their benefits. Okay. Mm -hmm. So those are important services as well. Yes. So let's switch gears now to weatherization of homes. It's a good way to help save money because we know that the energy costs are high in the winter time. So this is kind of your baby, the weatherization mm -hmm. programs. Um, talk us through it and how you all work together in this process. All right, first of all, in Massachusetts, it's, it's a really good time for energy efficiency. Of the 50 states in the country, per capita, we do more energy efficiency than any other state in the country. So it is a good time to be doing this. Um, for the Community Action Network, we provide weatherization and energy efficiency for people who are at 60% of median income or lower. And that 60% threshold, that is the LIHEAP, the fuel assistance cutoff. So for people who qualify, we have a number of different programs out there, some really terrific funding. The majority of the funding we're getting is right from our uh, utility companies. Hmm. So in this area, it's Eversource, National Grid, Columbia Gas, and up in my area, Berkshire Gas as well. Through the Green Communities Act, they provide funding so that we can do full-scale weatherization, we can do electrical audits where we can help people save money in their electric bill, we can even replace refrigerators if they're old and inefficient. So this is a free program to people, but other people are paying for it through their energy bills, right? And actually there's a program out there for everybody. In Massachusetts, everybody is eligible for some sort of energy efficiency. If it's through us, it's at absolutely no cost. If it's for somebody who's over income for our program, it'd be go going through MassSave, mm -hmm. where they still have some tremendous discounts up to 75% on, on, many, on many of the measures that they do. So what, how do you refer people to weatherization programs in the Springfield area in Hamden County? In Springfield, when we have LIHEAP applicants, um, if they s expressed interest with weatherization programs, we refer them to the Office of Housing. Right. And, you know, we can either refer them by giving them a phone number or just send over the information okay. so they're contacted. And how about through VOC? Similar process. So whenever we have applicants that are coming in, we're meeting with them. So we're talking through some of their issues. 
So that's how we find out what additional services they need and weatherization certainly being one of them. Speaking about issues, what are some of the major issues you notice people who are applying for LIHEAP services mm -hmm. face? Is it just low income or do they live in old homes that are drafty and their energy you know, might not keep them warm as much as it might in a brand new home with secure windows and doors and that kind of thing? What are you noticing are the big issues for people? Yeah, we're certainly finding a lot of households that maybe have not had the money to do a lot of the routine maintenance. And even though the weatherization is certainly not a home maintenance program, we go in and, and just kind of seal up the cracks, make sure the homes are insulated properly, make sure that they have a safe, effective heating system. We also have money to do heating system repairs and replacements, as does Valley Opportunity Council through our, what's called the HeartWAP program, which is kind of a piggyback to the fuel assistance program. So if people have a need, if the heating system isn't working or is inefficient, we can help them with that as well. And in big ways, like replace their whole oh, heating yeah. system? Um, Community Action this year in Franklin and Hampshire County will replace about 150 heating systems and end up doing other service for another 500 households. So, so it's, a, it's available to anybody who has a heating problem who is on fuel assistance who owns their home. And that would be at no cost to them to Correct. replace the heating okay. system. Correct. That's incredible. Yeah. Do you hope to expand that program in the future? Is there any way of doing that? Oh, we always have plans <laughs> to expand. Um, <laughs> And again, a lot of the funding we get is also from the utility companies. They mm. have recognized the need to do this as well. So even the electric utility companies provide money so that they can help augment our federally funded heating repair programs because with the, just the federal funding, we would not have the money to replace heating systems without having the customer get involved with paying part of it. So we can piggyback using some of the Eversource or National Grid money to help pay for a heating system to get it installed for a low income household. And do you do that throughout the year or do you do that specifically in the winter? We kind of do it two different methods. During the summer, we try to identify heating systems that may be working just fine, but are very old and inefficient and replace those. When it gets to this time of year, it's pretty, for the most part, just replacing emergency mm -hmm. heating systems that just go out and, and end up with no heat in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. And what are you finding are the biggest problems? Is it boilers that need to be replaced or what are the specifics with that? Yeah, the older boilers, older furnaces, a lot of them, um, the older models, they might have a lifespan of 30, 40 years and sometimes they slowly, gradually need to be replaced and other times they just spectacularly die in the middle of the night mm -hmm. and there's a, a lot of drama and a lot of angst. Isn't it always in the middle of the night? It can never be when you're, you know, warm one day and it happens to be a sunny December day. It's always when you really, really need it. It's awful. Um, are there problems specific to Western Massachusetts that you find that maybe other parts of Massachusetts might not face, in particular the way homes were created out here or how communities are made? Well, I think out here we do have a higher number of homes that are heated with a delivered fuel with oil or with kerosene as opposed to the eastern part of the state that has a lot more uh, natural gas. Mm -hmm. So as far as heating them, it's a little different issue for people who are low income. If you don't have money, you can't get a delivery of a delivered fuel, whereas if you have a utility and you are in good standing, the, the fuel keeps flowing. Mm. I think the homes out here may tend to be a little bit larger and older, so they're harder to heat and cost more money to heat. Mm. And back to your programs as well, when people are coming in and you're talking to them about getting um, fuel assistance, what are you hearing from them? Can you give us kind of a, an example of, of what exactly they say is the reason why they can't afford to heat their homes? We see a lot of hardworking people um, who just can't make ends meet. Um, you know, they're, they're not making it as much, so they're making a decision of either purchasing food or paying bills. and. You know, unfortunately, a lot of our customers that we see are elderly customers. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're seeing a lot of. And, you know, a lot of them will come in and apologize for having to apply for mm -hmm. fuel assistance because there's always this stigma that if they're getting assistance, maybe they don't really need it. But we encourage that everyone come in and apply because we understand the economy is not what it used to be mm -hmm. and so times does get you know it, it does get tough and instead of making a decision where they have to turn down the heat and possibly have some type of um, health effect mm -hmm. we prefer to offer that assistance. Do you notice families as well or also elderly through the VOC? Uh, I would say both. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've already received about 10,000 applications for fuel assistance Wow. Um, last year we helped about 16,600 and I would absolutely agree that one of the most common things people say is I'm working but I still don't have enough to 
heat my house and feed my kids. Mm -hmm. And that's, I, I think that's a really common misconception is mm -hmm. that the people that are on these programs don't work and that is just not true. Mm -hmm. And they're faced with a lot of really difficult situations and you know, I'm fortunate at Valley Opportunity Council that we have so many programs that we can help them in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a hard reality for a lot of our participants to have to make the choice between heating your house and feeding your kids. Well, Western Massachusetts is really fortunate to have all three organizations here represented and, and helping them throughout the winter. I don't know what people would do. Thousands of people, tens of thousands of people yeah. depend on you guys. So we really appreciate you being here and raising awareness about what you do and how people can get help. And we're also going to put your information about your website and your details on our website so that people can go and, and get that information, especially as it gets colder. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. And when we return, we'll be talking with one of the region's largest electric suppliers and what they're doing to help customers this winter. You're watching 22 News in Focus. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Today we're talking about issues surrounding the winter heating system. Utilities that provide energy to light and heat our homes are looking for ways to help their customers conserve energy and save money. You heard a little bit about that in the last segment. Joining me now to discuss programs available through Eversource Energy is Penny Connor, Chief Customer Officer and Senior Vice President of Customer Group for Eversource Energy. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Kate. This is great. So we have a lot of different entities of, of heating that we're talking about, but the first one is something that's you know, a little awkward for people each winter that we hear in the news industry, and that's they can just instantly blame the utilities companies for raising rates and causing all of their problems. But you actually issued um, a survey to customers to find out what their needs are and, and what their concerns might be. So can you talk about that? Be happy to, Kate. We spend a lot of time really listening to the voice of our customers, and we reach out to our customers both with surveys, with focus groups, uh, to really understand their needs so we can best tell our, our services to them, but also refine our messaging and outreach so that it's making sense, so that we really understand their needs and how we can best meet them. So what are the, some of the things that they said in their surveys? Well, in the surveys, it's very clear that when our customers think of Eversource, they want uh, the power on, they want the gas flowing, and they, they really are concerned about pricing. Mm -hmm. And where Eversource can help our customers there is really help them with managing their energy usage. Okay, so can you talk a little bit about that, how they can manage their energy usage? Well, I'd be happy to. One of the things we're very excited about is we just rolled out our new bill, mm -hmm. which helps customers, I think, visually understand where their energy is going. So at Eversource, we deliver the energy. We're like the postal service. We deliver mm -hmm. the energy. We actually don't generate any electricity. We buy it on the market. And because we're in the New England region, prices ebb and flow and that's some of the frustration you mm -hmm. hear from customers. So what we're interested in providing our customers is information so they understand their usage and then programs and services that surround that that help them manage their usage. And we hear about these third-party energy suppliers that first go through you, right, and then offer their own pricing to people. Can you talk about how that works? Because I think a lot of people are confused about these third-party companies out there that pop up, it seems, in the wintertime especially. Especially. So <laughs> in New England and Massachusetts, we're, we really do have a rather complex energy marketplace, and our consumers really need to be savvy to participate. The good news is that consumers can choose who supplies their energy. Uh, and at Eversource, we provide on our website information and linkages to uh, information about those suppliers. And I encourage consumers, we encourage consumers to really do their research on various suppliers about the rates they're offering, about the terms of those rates or conditions, and uh, what are the terms if they uh, decide they don't want that service anymore. Mm -hmm. So the competitive suppliers, we do bill for those suppliers on our bill, but as far as the relationship, the, the suppliers will reach out to these customers and they will actually uh, handle phone calls if the customer is concerned about that supply piece of their bill. It's confusing. It is confusing and customers really need to be eyes wide open uh, because our, con our competitive suppliers, some of them may offer a very low 
uh, en uh, entry rate uh, that is variable, and you have to listen as a consumer to, to ensure that you understand if that rate's going to go up over a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. Consumers can save money uh, by researching and going on competitive supply, but it really does require a vigilance uh, by the consumer to make sure they understand uh, what the supplier is offering. So when people are looking, and let's see if we can get that video again of the new bills. Um, when they're looking at the bill, it does break it down pretty specifically. And how can people look at that and then try to save money? What, what exactly could they do on So there? I'm so glad you have the new <laughs> bill. First off, it's in color. Yeah. And so we have, for the first time, a, a color bill that offers our customers, uh, particularly on the front page, you're looking at the back right now, but that front page, the main information when we listen to focus groups, customers wanted to know how much the bill was and when it's due, and you can see that's very, very prominent. Mm -hmm. In this, uh, on the right-hand side of the bill, you see what we call the disaggregation bar, where you see the delivery charges, and that is the piece that Eversource is providing. Those are the charges associated with the pipes that are the wires that are delivering service to your home. And then you see the supply piece, mm -hmm. and that's where if the customer is on our basic service, we'll go and procure supply for customers. That's the supply piece they'd see, or if they're on competitive supply, they would see that competitive supply piece. On the left-hand side of that first page, uh, you would see uh, the graph shows their 13 months of usage oh. and provides them their actual usage per day and gives them an indication if that usage is going up or down. So now as a consumer, I can compare my usage in the month that's highlighted in green there mm -hmm. compared to the previous month or all the way to the left-hand side, how that was last uh, November or last December. So I start to have some immediate information that helps me diagnose uh, my bill. If our customers, and we have 30% of our customers who actually receive electronic billing, their electronic bill allows them to go to immediately to uh, their energy savings uh, platform, their profile, where they can actually get customized information about how the uh, techniques they may use to actually reduce those uh, bill. Any customer can go online and uh, look up their account and start to get information on our energy savings platform. Okay. So for the supply and demand part of it, that might be something that people might not fully understand. Is there anything they can do for that or is that just what the rate is and, and what the delivery is that season? So uh, the biggest way that customers can manage the bill mm -hmm. is to actually address their usage yeah. and how they're using energy. And that's where uh, using the tools, you, the previous panel talked about all of the energy efficiency programs that are offered. Uh, that is really a great uh, way to tap into ways to save energy, whether it's by weatherizing your home or investing in new uh, uh, LED lighting. Items like that or high efficiency appliances will reduce the usage, and that's really the best way to address both parts of that bill. Okay, let's talk about interest rates. In the past, again, people complain all oh, the, the the not the interest rates, the the rates themselves yes. go up some years, and people complain about that in the news industry. We we deal with that, which is why I'm bringing it up. But this past summer, this past winter, and now this year in January, it seems the the rate is going down the supply rate the so supply rate. every six months we uh, go out into the marketplace and procure basic service which is the supply portion so uh, as I said Eversource we do not own any generation facilities but we do go into the marketplace and procure energy for our customers who choose to have basic service and again customers can choose to have a competitive supplier so those uh, the basic service charge mm -hmm. would be what you would want to compare to if you're considering a competitive supplier. Mm -hmm. uh, but that price is going down and it's largely uh, the volatility of the marketplace is due to the fact that uh, in New England we have, uh, you know, a uh, large uh, part of our generation is sourced with natural gas. Mm -hmm. That price fluctuates and we see that in the marketplace. Uh, when we go to procure. So that's a big, big driver for the pricing. So customers are happy about a lower supply rate, of course. We're, yes, we're encouraged by the lower prices. We're glad we were able to procure uh, lower prices for our customers. And uh, But we would encourage uh, consumers not to uh, get wooed by the lower prices, but to still think about how can they uh, use energy more wisely. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is really uh, the, the secret sauce. All right, we'll talk more about that after the break. You're watching 22 News in Focus.
Welcome back to 22 News in Focus. Today we're talking about ways to save on winter energy costs in particular. We're continuing our conversation now with Penny Connor, Chief Customer Officer and Senior Vice President of Customer Group for Eversource Energy. And joining our conversation in this segment is Bill Stack, Program Manager of Residential Energy Efficiency at Eversource Energy. Welcome, Bill. Thank you very much. <laughs> and welcome back, Penny. Thank you. <laughs> so before we get into ways that people can save money and on their energy bills, I wanted to talk about the whole east-west, eastern Massachusetts, western Massachusetts divide that a lot of people in western Massachusetts feel. Are the, the prices for um, energy in eastern Massachusetts different from that in western Massachusetts, do you find? They are different. The rates are different in western Mass, uh, and that was, those rates were developed uh, at the time, Western Mass Electric would have developed uh, various rates to cover the recover the cost associated with delivering the energy to the system, and that that is a different infrastructure than, for say, uh, in, for example, in a downtown Boston. Okay, and I know that natural gas pipelines there there are more of them in Eastern Mass than Western Mass. Would that affect the the rate of electric electricity or other services that you might provide for one side of the state versus the other? No, the natural gas infrastructure that is needed for generation is not affected by those. The small those ones very, The local uh, customers on natural gas supply can be impacted by, by those, those lines, but okay. not, not the generation. Okay, so now we'll switch gears now to, to saving on their electric bills and other utility bills. Why, as a company that makes money off of energy, would you want to help people save money on energy? This is a, it's one of my favorite yes, questions yeah, because yeah. it is, it's, it's a hard complex. Why, why would we try to reduce the usage? The beautiful thing is that Massachusetts recognizes that energy efficiency is, the, is one of the lowest cost fuels, really, to fuel our, our uh, need for electricity. If you think about energy efficiency as just another fuel source, like another generating plant, that's really what it is. And it is, at three cents a kilowatt hour, one of the lowest cost types of sources. So Massachusetts has said, we want energy efficiency. They've created a regulatory structure where it makes sense for all the parties, consumers, for utilities, to all be fully engaged in this. And as a result, Massachusetts is now six years in a row been number one in ACEEE in energy efficiency. And, uh, and Eversource, we're very proud of the fact that we were recognized as the number one provider of energy efficiency solutions in the country. But one of the sound bites that I think is fascinating, our consumers, thousands of businesses and residential consumers all across Massachusetts have been investing in energy efficiency in the last three years alone, just in Eversource territory. Those consumers built the equivalent of a 500 megawatt power plant. Hmm. That is how much they are saving in energy that we would have had to build a power plant to produce. 500 megawatt power plant. And the beautiful thing is it didn't need to be sited. We don't have any pesky NIMBY issues. I mean, this is a wonderful way. It uses local labor. We have created thousands of jobs in energy efficiency hmm. because energy efficiency is delivered locally. If you're doing weatherization, and Bill's going to talk about that, that is locally local jobs. Mm -hmm. So this is a real powerful economic engine for Massachusetts. So are people paying for these energy efficiency programs through parts of their bill each month? Is that how it works? Yes, as a percentage of every bill, um, it's like 0 0.025, just a small percentage of every uh, kilowatt hour that uh, that uh, people use, there's a surcharge on that. Those dollars are funneled to the MassSave uh, energy efficiency program. And then MassSave pays for local businesses to go out and do the weatherization programs and, ma and everything else. We do. We contract. We have a lead vendor that uh, uses a series of open market contractors, uh, uh, independent uh, weatherization contractors. We have over 100 participating. We have almost 50 uh, home performance contractors that do the assessments for us as well. That's on the market rate, if you will, uh, programs. We also partner with the, the CAP people that you just uh, were speaking mm -hmm. with. They're our actual boots on the ground when we're serving the low-income community as well. And their knowledge for all these different communities is so uh, advantageous for us because they have a, a great knowledge as of the properties that really need to be served. And so we partner with them with our programs to make sure that we're able to get to all the uh, programs that, uh, all the properties that they suggest we, we serve right away. And you also work with housing authorities, right? 
We do. We partner with the housing authorities. Again, CAPS help us with that, but nobody knows the properties in certain communities better than the housing right. authorities. So both through community relations department, but mostly with our energy efficiency department, we will work with those properties, uh, the, the housing authorities, to um, s serve the properties that they, they tell us right away what needs what needs to be taken care of. And what kind of things would that include? Would it be replacing LED light bulbs or, or adding LED light bulbs and, and getting rid of what they had before that maybe drained all the energy? Is it that kind of thing? It or? Absolutely is. Well, the first thing to look at is heating systems if it's a multifamily housing authority property because that's the high expense things. And then of course go in and redo all the lighting as well. Change the mm -hmm. old incandescent bulbs to LED bulbs. So they start saving on the electric bill and they start saving on the heating bills as well. Well. And then if there's an opportunity to do weatherization, add insulation or air sealing, uh, we'll, we'll take advantage of that opportunity and make sure those needs are served as well. How do you prioritize all of these projects? I mean, this is a huge undertaking to, to make Massachusetts, you know, greener and, and make them more energy efficient. It's a lot to do. So do you prioritize in some way over another, like businesses versus residential, or what do you do? Well, we, we encourage everyone to participate. Our programs are large. We uh, work with um, an Energy Efficiency Advisory Council that Massachusetts has set up that helps us identify the next leading edge areas that we need to be addressing, such as if we are testing out and piloting some new demand programs that will be coming up next year. But in, in all honesty, the programs are there for customers. We're not turning anyone away. This is, we, we are really, our priorities inside our shop and we have a great team uh, all across all three states. They're thinking all the time about how do we get the message out to businesses so that they will participate in a program. So mm -hmm. we're really trying to secure people into the programs um, versus prioritizing anyone out. And do you find that most people are willing to get involved in this kind of thing, energy efficiency? And well, it's interesting. So uh, where we're having the most success with our largest accounts mm -hmm. is setting up multi-year strategic energy plans. Mm -hmm. So Mayor Sarno was one of the leaders here in Western Mass, okay. signed one in 2013. We're getting ready to sign the next one. And as part of that, uh, he set a goal to reduce by 4 million kilowatt hours. We have, as part of that, worked a whole portfolio of investments around the school systems to and uh, housing projects to uh, really retrofit those uh, facilities and designing new facilities, new high schools that have gone in and building energy efficiency right in. Uh, UMass Amherst we have had a long, uh, long standing relationship with and uh, again a multi-year strategic energy plan and we just uh, celebrated 10 years, a decade partnership with Yankee Candle oh. and I think their story is interesting they saw great benefit from LED lights, mm -hmm. but because the LED lights don't produce as much heat, and mm -hmm. you think about retail space and how hot that is, so we're working in Deerfield and we're piloting this, they were able to reduce their cooling systems. Hmm. So they don't need as much cooling energy, and then they propagated that out to their various franchisees. That makes sense. Yeah. Wow, so you're always thinking about new ways to, to help make this, help in all different types of uh, businesses, uh, energy saving needs, right? Exactly. Uh, really, our team is trying to think about those different verticals and what is their value proposition? What is it that we need to deliver that's going to make sense for them? Be, be, you know, we're thinking about it from energy terms, but, but you know, uh, Yankee Candle's thinking about it from, I need good lighting. Right. And they were not ready to propagate this lighting into their franchises until they tested it out in their Deerfield facility. Mm -hmm. Would you say the LED lights that they had to buy to replace the old ones are more expensive and save just in the long run because they don't have to replace them? Is the initial cost higher for these kinds of energy efficient? For the residents, they can be, yes. But like you said, the lifetime is so much longer. Um, there's a, when I go out and talk to different community um, groups, I, I mention how if you had a baby today and put in a new LED, you might not have to change that until the baby goes to college. That's the lifespan some of these bulbs have. And so there's initial out-of-pocket cost that's a little bit higher than a regular old incandescent bulb, uh, bulb but the, the lifetime of that you'll save, you know, first of all, they use 80% less energy, and second of all, look how much longer they last on mm -hmm. a regular bulb. So the savings start immediately, even though there's a small incremental higher price on an LED. Okay, interesting. So we're going to actually look at ways that people can save money by going into our Mass Appeal set, and, and you're going to show us how all of these things really work. So you're watching 22 News in Focus, and we'll be doing that right after the break.
watching 22 News in Focus. Today we've been talking about fuel assistance and weatherization efforts to save energy and increase fuel efficiency. We're back now in the kitchen with Bill Stack, <laughs> Program Manager of Residential Energy Efficiency at Eversource Energy. I have to say, I never get to be in here, so this is really cool, and we get to be interactive with in Focus. This so, is great. I wish my you. kitchen at home looked just like Me this. Too. It's very nice. <laughs> and it all works. It does. Nice. <laughs> so first of all, when people want to get an assessment of their home and figure out how they can save money on energy. What are some ways, just looking around this kitchen, that they might be able to, to do that? Well, a great thing that we offer is the no-cost home energy assessment where the energy specialist will come to your home and from your attic to your basement, look at the um, insulation levels, look at windows, look at appliances, electronics, anything, heating system, of course, anything that's using any type of energy, uh, they'll review and then sit down with you in a kitchen like this and go over a specific energy report for you with recommendations as to what you should do to improve the efficiency of your home. By becoming more energy efficient, that's the number one step a homeowner can take mm. to get control of the energy costs and also uh, the energy usage. How much money would you say that people can actually save by, make, by taking that step? Well, it depends on the size of the home. Uh, for example, I recently attended an assessment where we, we changed out dozens of LED lights. Mm -hmm. And just that change of lighting, taking out the old incandescent bulbs, putting in LEDs that use, as we mentioned, 80% less energy, is going to start saving them, first of all, out-of-pocket expense because we put these in at no cost yeah. and there's no limit as to how many you can receive. And also, of course, going forward on their electric bill, they're going to be saving a significant amount of money in high-use areas as well. And that those are installed at no cost during the assessment. Wow. So the company that comes in will just have a bunch of LED lights and when needed replace the ones that might be old incandescent ones. Absolutely. They, they'll take out the old incandescent bulbs and there's a vast array of bulbs that are offered as well. They, they have the candelabra bulbs, they have glow bulbs now, people have them in the bathroom vanity. So there's a vast array of bulbs that are available to them, uh, to the homeowner and again they'll start saving from day one. And this is all through Mass Save, right? This is all through the Mass Save program, yes. So is there any difference with the lighting, how, how the lights look with LED versus incandescent? Are they duller? Or? No, they're much brighter. Okay, brighter. Um, yeah, they're a uh, light emitting diode, so they're very very um, central, a great place for them is in the kitchen mm -hmm. because a lot of places now have the recessed lighting and it just really illuminates the area mm -hmm. as well. So they're much brighter, uh, much cooler, of course, as we mentioned as well, so they don't emit much heat on there. And um, again, um, as soon as you start putting these in, you'll be saving from day one. Wow, all right. Other parts of the kitchen that might be well, things to look uh, at? The refrigerator is the big energy use in the kitchen, of course. It's yeah. on 24-7, 365. Um, so we recommend if you have a 10-year-old unit or more or, or older that you, sh you should probably replace that mm. um, because you start saving. And, of course, any, any appliance you buy, you want to use Energy, uh, energy Star uh, uh, appliances. Right. Um, but the refrigerator, we have a great program. It's a recycling program where if you are buying a new refrigerator, um, a lot of stores will charge you a Holloway price mm. come and charge you to take it away we have a recycling program where we'll pick up the refrigerator at no cost for you we'll make sure it gets recycled 97 percent of what we of the refrigerator that we we uh, collect gets recycled wow. and then a few weeks later we send you a 50 dollar rebate check as well so it's a win-win for everybody it's a win for us because we get the old appliance off our grid mm -hmm. uh, the customer has a new high efficiency um, refrigerator going forward so they'll save an electric bill gets recycled, and then, of course, $50 comes a few weeks later. Yeah, that's great. And you're saying in the past 10 years, uh, or if it's 10 years old or older, because energy save might not have been around back then? Well, no, they're just they're, they're manufactured more efficient now. Okay. Models, of the, the level of efficiency have raised over the, few, over the, over the course of those years. So, um, you know, we do run into places where, as um, uh, Peter was saying, you know, you might have, a, some people might have a 25, 30 year old mm -hmm. refrigerator in the low income program. We'll replace that for free at no cost. And similar on the market rate program, people should replace their refrigerator if it's that or just get to a new efficiency one. And, and like I said, we'll be able to assist with uh, taking it away. Wow, let's talk about other things here. Sure. Christmas lights, of course. Yep, you know, if the holiday lights are out, and I notice you have yours here. We do. Yeah, Very though festive. they're not LEDs, but I can leave a set here for you if need be. <laughs> Again, these use 80% less energy when you're putting them outside. Um, we suggest that, if possible, when you have outside ones, put them on a timer. Okay. And that way, um, 
they won't be running all night. They can shut off at a certain amount of time. You're not using energy all night long. Mm -hmm. um, we want you to be careful. Make sure that you don't overload outlets. If you've ever seen the movie Christmas Vacation <laughs> with Chevy Chase, that's not what you want to do. Right. So if you have to run a separate uh, extension cord, please do that to a different outlet so you don't over overload <laughs> an outlet. Um, and they, again, these are these are the incandescent ones which are which are on display here as well. Mm -hmm. And they they use uh, these the LEDs. They use 80% less electricity um, for that. So we strongly recommend that you go to the LED. And these last for years longer than the incandescent yes, ones might. Yes. Yes. Exactly. They they'll, they'll la these will last about 12 years uh, because there's such a short period of time that they're actually being in use for the, the December time period. Mm -hmm. And one of the great things, having put. Um, the one in the family has been putting electric lights outside, all the lights <laughs> yeah. outside for 30 years. If one of these bulbs go out, the whole strand doesn't go out. Oh, so that's okay. a great, as long as it's not crushed or broken, um, you don't have to worry about it. all of a sudden the whole strand goes out because one bulb burns out. That's another reason to get them. Absolutely. And then I'm, I'm guessing they come in the same different styles as the regular. They do. Design. They have smaller ones that, you know, that some people like, the, and they also have the large bulb LEDs that's available as well. And the white versus the colored lights. White, they have ice blue, yeah, multicolored, yeah. You, and um, there's, there's several varieties that you can choose from. So do you find that people in December do spend a significantly larger amount of money on their electric bills because of the Christmas tree lights and the lights outside? And You're right. Um, in the summertime, of course, we see uh, electric bills spike because people are using their air conditioning. Mm -hmm. And then around the Christmas holidays, probably from early December to first week in January, that graph that Penny talked about mm -hmm. that's on our bill, you'll see there's a spike usually in December, even though the days are shorter and you're not really using that much more um, indoor lighting, but because people do outdoor lighting and the holiday lighting. Yeah, absolutely. There's a little bit of a spike e each holiday season. So one way they can save on that bill in particular is getting the LED lights and, like you said, putting it on a timer. Anything else they could do? Um, on, uh, depending on what they have in the home, if they get electronics during the holiday season, you can always get an advanced power strip. These are also provided at no cost during a home energy assessment. Wow. And what these do is they, after 75 minutes, they can tell if, if uh, let's say, an Xbox is in use. If it's not in use, it automatically shuts it off. Hmm. Anything with the transformer is always drawn energy and as you look around here like the microwave the stove they have clocks those are always drawing energy even though they're not in use right so that's what the big thing is with, with electronics <coughs> you, um, we promote a couple of plugs here usually the cable box stays on or the TV stays on yeah. because people DVR uh, oh, a TiVo so, thing so the gray ones mean they stay on they all the stay time. on the time the green ones will shut off when, let's say you have a computer entertainment <coughs> system games that are DVD plays uh, that are set up with it that people don't use all the time um, those will automatically shut off interesting I've never seen something like that yeah. how about phone chargers there's kind of a, a debate going on at least here about phone chargers being plugged into the wall but maybe no phone attached to them do they really drain that much electricity that it could show up on a bill as it a could, you know it's called phantom power that's things that are plugged in that aren't in use it five to ten percent of your electric bill every month could be phantom power so yes a phone charger plugged in with a transformer is drawing some some energy and even if your phone's not in the charger at the time. Hmm. So yes, it is drawing power. I, I mean, it's not that significant in a household. I would imagine all the electronic equipment you have yeah. here <laughs> with transformers plugged in. There might be significant savings there if they uh, took some step to unplug that. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Great, we appreciate thank you. it. We'll Great. have the last word for you right after the break. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Watching 22 News in Focus. Today we've been talking about issues surrounding winter heating, including fuel assistance and weatherization programs. So we hope you've learned something today that will help you or a neighbor in need. You can find links on our website to all our guest organizations if you need more information. That's our program for today, and we want to thank our guests for joining us, and thanks to you at home for watching. Remember, if you missed any of it, you can watch it in full on our website at wwlp.com. And from all of us here at 22 News, we wish you a wonderful Sunday and happy holidays.